cork. I should have bought all this wine and put it in my cellar because I'm sure they're going dry. No, exactly. Now, now you're coming to the, to the important thing. So, I mean, the coronavirus has forced, has forced basically everyone to rethink their business models, right? So, do you have any changes or new ideas in mind or uh, maybe even for, for um, um, wine producers? I mean, if not for, for Uncork itself. What are your thoughts about this the industry, the marketing, um, your own business? You know, just you must have been thinking about all of this while sitting there, sipping your yeah, at least you have a stash that you can sip, right? So that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there's no doubt this is this has shaken the industry completely. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm of the opinion that in some of some of the decisions made are going to really have detrimental effects on you know, the, the businesses, um, you know, beyond just wineries, right through the value chain, um, in the hospitality industry, and all. I, I think what what it is going to do is it's going to start propping up a few opportunities for people to really start partnering where there's mutual benefit interest. Um, uh, maybe just to put that in context, I think that you're going to find more and more wineries and, and possibly restaurants working together, closer together, where the benefit is not so much about how can you make my business grow, but how can we work together to make sure your winery is profitable, successful, and my restaurant is in the same space. Mm -hmm. And I really am hoping that that is going to be, um, going to be something that, that is the fruit that comes out of all the pain that we're going through now. The other part is I think that we might get a swing in some localization. So possibly yeah. local restaurants supporting local wineries, even more so than what they do at the moment. Um, uh, I think general feeling is that we want to make sure that people in our community are eating and drinking and their kids are going to school. And how better can we do that than actually supporting their own businesses? Um, and maybe the last thing, I think just innovation. Uh, it's for me amazing to watch all these digital wine tastings and it's not just here i mean winemakers doing tastings across the globe of their product um, as it's available some winemakers are only able to do that because you know their wines aren't obviously being able to be sold locally um, but people are starting to engage more with their stories through social media and i'm really excited to see one of the changes that you know the not necessarily the investment in money, but the investment in time that that the manufacturers are putting uh, into into social media is fantastic. Because this isn't a money this isn't a money area. Spending more money in social media is not the answer. Spending more time um, is, and I'm glad to see that that's where it's going to. More more winemakers are have been on social media that I've seen in the last three weeks um, than I've probably seen since the start of of Uncork. Um, and it's probably a bit uncomfortable at first, but I think that after three weeks of doing it, they seem to be really comfortable in front of a camera and understanding which angles work well and which ones don't. I think that's right. And I think also that will, I think the next step um, beyond that is that people will see that people want to consume online content. Like you say, it's, mm -hmm. it's not about spending money, it's about creating engaging content in, in, in stories. But also, I think another area that's not been tapped yet is actual um, education. I think people will be hungry to learn more and um, um, it's easy to learn this type of stuff, um, you know, with, with, I think online courses and that type of stuff in the wine industry is also going to grow. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think in general, the, the ability to adopt technology is just uh, it's leapfrogged. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's sometimes, they, at the moment, we're just not presented with any alternatives. So what, what you do with spare time if you're at home and you're not able to work um, and you're passionate about this industry, you, you know, you log on to the internet and you find something to read about, a new article, uh, you go and listen to a winemaker talking or you go and invest in you know, actual qualifications. I, I think there, yeah. is, there is going to be a birth of a whole new style. And I, don't, I think it's been there. I think the adoption rate is just going to be significantly greater um, in, in the months and the years to come because I think that the idea of returning to what was normal is far-fetched. I think we're going to return to a very different normal than what we expect. I agree with you. I think, you know, like you say, it's just the process was there anyway. It's just been accelerated. But I think the other important thing that you mentioned is lo locality, right? I think because of the whole, um, I mean, the whole worldwide tourism industry is going to take a knock. So local tourism is going to be the first to bounce back. So people are going to be forced to, 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 to provide also, I think, pricing um, for, for not for international tourists, but pricing for the local market in terms of the old tourism yeah. experience is going to be important. 
Uh, absolutely, and they're, they're, you know, it's it's where we talk about these, you know, these part of genuine interest partnerships where all people involved have got to, have got to win. You know, some of these venues will not will not survive without local tourists supporting in the next, you know, the next twelve months, and hopefully we'll start gearing things in in all ways. But for a restaurant to do that, for you know, a hospitality establishment to do that, they also need the support of the, you know, really right at the supply chain. You know, who's who's mm-hmm. providing them what product and how are they, what role are they playing to make it more more effective as well. So it is. Is this this genuine you know this, this partnership that needs to be created and i'm hoping that you know this is one of the areas that i hope uncork will will benefit um and certainly start focusing on is the role that we can play in making sure people are aware of you know where there is um, you know where, where the company was companies that are struggling where the companies that are succeeding what kind of partnership opportunities exist and what role people can play in, in joining together um uh, it, it, it's just such an important part, and it's sad for me every time I, you know, open up and I see a story of a business closing. It really feels like it's a personal, a personal stab, um, and and I'm hoping that in some way we can inspire one more person to walk into that store and talk about it, and you know, kind of elevate elevate the opportunity that people have to to keep their businesses open. I, I totally agree with you. So your vision for Uncork um, 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 after all of this and then going forward, what do you, what, do you, what, where do you see yourself going and growing with this? So strange enough, and the I think the Uncork journey is is about diversification this in, into different platforms. So I think the 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 ask we are at the moment we're moving to focus a bit more on on a blog um, and get the website up and running. Um, I've also started expanding out a little bit outside of Uncork. So um, I've started a new page called Crafted in Africa. Um, actually, funny enough, at the start around about the start of lockdown. Um, I've realized that some products don't naturally fit into the uncork world, um, which really is tending towards focus on premium wine and, and spirits sporadically. Um, Crafted in Africa is really honing in specifically on products that are produced locally only. Um, it tends away from sophistication of wine and talks to probably a younger, a younger audience. Um, and also refers to, you know, quite a big focus on the craft brewing industry, which I think is, um, you know, really in a really uh, a tough state i think at the moment um not necessarily battling through some scale um i've also you know worked outside that into another site called family friendly which is talking more to you know the environment with where parents and children are both welcome in fact where parents where kids are welcome but parents can also come um, so probably playing around the peripheral of of uncork without losing you know the, the really essence of of uncork which i still need to you know continue so, to drive the message is around this um this curi- curiosity to just to to explore explore craftsmanship and what, what we can deliver here um almost like a type I, of hoping that, tourism right yeah I, I, so i've i've, I've done a, a little bit and i've i've tried to work with with some local hotels restaurants and and that is really something that that whilst i whilst i'd like to do it's only where, where it comes across as authentic uh, mm-hmm. the limitation of always this is i don't get to define where uncork goes um, I talk about the ideas in my mind, but the reason why Craft in Africa has, has popped up as a sideline is that whilst I've tried and I've tried to explore different passions through Uncork, the reality is the community who follow Uncork um, have clearly called it. That's not, you know, it doesn't fit into what they want to see and therefore it helps to branch out elsewhere. And I'm excited about that because I don't have, because there's no agenda personally, it allows me to really explore, um, to really explore what people want and deliver that. Um, but yeah, I, I am kind of hoping that in the really long term, this may be a space for me to fall back, fall back on in you know later on in life and expand more to how I can use this to focus on tourism. Um, at the moment, uh, like anybody who reaches out and asks for advice, you know, which winery should I go and see? Which region? I'm coming to South Africa. Um, can you please give me an itinerary of what I need to do? I'm here for three weeks. Um, yeah, you know, it's a really daunting task, but it's mm-hmm. it's lovely. And if um, just to be able to chat to them at this stage, it's purely to help somebody out, um, who knows, maybe in 15 years time, I'm going to need to rely a bit more on Uncork for, you know, for different kind of means. Um, at this stage, it's a passion, it's a hobby. I hope to live it out uh, as best as I can. And I hope just to bring more people on board who want to learn more about our product. Um, oh, awesome. So yeah. tell me your wine journey. Let, let me ask you this. What is the most important thing you learned from your wine journey so far? Um, so you spoke about stories earlier. I'd go one step further. That the the most important aspect of any um of any journey that i've been on both wine and spirits has been revolved purely around relationships 
Um, and I can't express this um, enough. It may be more what I've learned in the social media world than wine, uh, but it translates really closely into what, what I've um, done with Uncork. Um, it is all about relationships. Uh, you know, I've seen really big businesses make offers of, you know, almost obscene amounts just, you know, for exposure, you know, we'll send you this and we'll send you this, is what we pay for it. And you either take it or leave it. And, you know, the response is always from us, I leave it. I have no interest whatsoever um, in doing this. What, what I've worked with from the start is um, a producer picks up the phone or drops me a DM and says, Hey, yeah, have you heard of our product? Are you interested in trying it? Um, we'd love you to come out to the estate if you can. If not, you know, can you give us an address to send through a sample? Um, these and it doesn't end there when i if i do taste i actually want to hear from them i want to hear what they thought what they thought about the wine what they thought about the vintage um and when i said all revolves around relationship it's because it is impossible to unlock that story without a true relationship um, sure. the story that you get is a marketing story unless it's told by somebody who's intimately involved with it um, and I, you know, I think there's there's nothing better than, for me than hearing you know Batu talk about L2 um, about a specific vintage and how he remembers how hot it was for you know walking up and down through the vineyards. There, there's nothing. Yes, you can read about the rainfall in that year, and you, somebody will tell you statistically whether it was a hotter or a colder year than the other. Um, but walking through the vineyard, talking to him about it, or hearing him talk about it, it just fundamentally changes the the experience, and that's when you actually live the story. The story is translated from something written down to something that you feel. Um, and so, you know, actually, it's, it's really advice, I'd say, to people who are toying around with exploring social media as a brand is don't be fooled into the idea of thinking that you're just pushing content out and hoping it's going to get consumed like a TV advert. You've got to consider this as a conversation that you're starting with somebody. The simplest one is you know, somebody walks, walks up to you at the office and says, hey, you, know, you, look, you look really nice today or those are really cool shoes. Um, and then they just turn around and walk away and don't say anything back. For me, social media is sometimes interpreted, particularly in bigger brands, sadly, um, that's how it's lived out. You know, they put out a wonderful advert of beautiful imagery and the most, you know, a huge expense uh, put into how to make a product presentable. And then I watched people commenting and saying, hey, this looks absolutely amazing. Where is the estate? And you know, months go by and nobody There's responds no to answer. it. Like you've just had all the options. You spend all of this money and effort getting people there that love what you're doing. And then when they talk to you, you turning your back and ignoring them. It feels to me like it's one of those old high school movies. And it's the, you know, the quarterback turning around and walking away from, um, mm. from somebody talking. It just feels that you've missed all, like what, what social media, the heart of it really is. But I think that's a misunderstanding because, you know, most, most marketing people are still um, trained in traditional marketing methods of um, traditional radio, TV and, and, and uh, you know, magazine advertising or the traditional advertising um, type of thing where you don't, in, in, you actually put, put an ad out there and you hope people will call you. Whereas with social media, you know, you, as you just said, it's all about engagement with your, with your you know, it's actually yeah. talking to people and that's what people don't get. They, 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 they focus on the media part instead of the social part. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, the, the more premium your product, um, the less important, I'd say, it is to focus on the metric. Um, right. you know, it's, it's one of one of the areas that we often see like these statistics come through about the engagement percentage rates. And yes, those those are you know, really important, I suppose. You, you have to consider them and they, they are important to know, particularly if you're spending money in the space, you know, what you're getting back for it. But if you're an ultra, if you're an ultra premium wine, and, you, and, I, and I say you're selling you're selling a bottle of wine for six hundred rand a bottle, mm -hmm. you don't need to have three thousand people seeing your advert and one thousand responding to it and commenting on your on your post. What you need is you need somebody who absolutely loves what you're doing, who's engaging with you consistently, and you know what they're willing to put in the money to go and pick up your product and buy it. You need to focus on which one of those engagements out of all of the the, the pools that come in, which are the ones that are really critically important. Um, and the only way to do that is to respond to the conversation. And yeah, I, I agree with you about the traditional media components. I think so many people are trained on um, the, the old school way of marketing and please, it's been really successful. And, and, and I've got to say, there's some wineries that have taken to the social media piece exceptionally well. In most cases, when the response comes back, it is generally from somebody who um, is intimately involved with social media from a different aspect and happens to be doing it for the winery as well. 
Um, or the alternative is that they are so intimately involved with the wine that they can't help themselves but spill the story in their conversation. It just comes, you know, the passion of what they do just literally comes through the words as they write. I love the, the romantic part. I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. It's, it's the difference between having a sales orientation and having and building a long-term viable brand and loving your brand. And ultimately, if you want it to work, you, I, I will put money on it that where it works is where the owners of the farm or the owners of the estate are personally involved because they love their brand. Uh, absolutely. Look, I, I think that there have been examples that I've seen of, of, bigger, of bigger corporate players. And uh, what it always comes down to is an individual who takes personal right. ownership. Whether they happen to be an owner or they happen to be a, an employee, when there is an individual who loves so much what they do um, that they can't help but behave like an owner. And that is, that's really where, where you have the ultimate win. And to be honest, from a corporate, um, they get the best benefit of it, individuals who behave that way because they're behaving as, you know, the owner mentality is just so important. But that works in all aspects of management, managing a business, not just in the marketing, right? Absolutely. So, Fred, so I, the last thing that I'd like to hear from you is, um, I, I, you need to give us your very own wine quote or your favorite wine quote. So my very own one, I'd, I'd struggle to create. I mean, there's, there's so many amazing, <laughs> amazing quotes out there. Um, but there is, there is one which, which comes to mind, um, which I'd have to steal. And I wish I knew who, who it was authored by. Um, but it taps on two things which are really important to me. So, um, yeah, it goes like this. Right? Wine is a little like love. When the right one comes along, you'll definitely know it. That is a very good, I actually love that one. That's, that's, I haven't heard it before. So that, that sounds, it sounds like something that Mark Twain would say. But uh, it's, it's, it's perfect, <laughs> it does right? sound like it's come straight out of a poet, a poet's yeah. mouth, right? Um, so, and and I'll tell you that th this is this is no truer than the uncorked journey for me. It's uh, this, it's been this feeling of falling in love with with wine and the industry, one glass at a time, and um, one conversation with a producer at a time. It's this evolution and a uh, continuously growing journey. Um, I feel really privileged to have been a part of you know of of what this uh, how this has developed. Um, and yeah, I, I just hope that there's there are wineries out there that are benefit, benefiting from it. Um, and those that would like to benefit or feel they could benefit, please reach out, have a chat, and let's see where it goes. Now, now that on that page, how did I get all of you? Where do people find you? Well, so and the easiest, as I said, is probably um, is directly on Instagram at uncork underscore SA. Um, the alternative is to drop me an email at drinks at uncork.co.za. Um, or through any of the social media channels, uh, WhatsApp or email are both available there as well. Um, you'll be surprised that I, you know, every comment that comes through, so you don't need to send a DM, it helps, but uh, every comment that comes through on, on, on Uncork, um, I follow, read, you know, try, to, try to get involved with. And um, yeah, if, if you struggle one way or other, please try a different channel. And at worst comes, worst come worst, go straight onto the website www.uncork.co.za and leave us a comment there and it drops straight through to my mailbox as well. Okay, perfect. Uh, we will leave all those links obviously in the show's uh, description and everything. Fred, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, thanks for spending awesome the time. Work. I know you are a busy family man, so um, I appreciate it and um, thank you. Awesome. Well, and thank you very much for what you do for, for the industry and the people that are involved with it as well. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited and certainly a, a privilege to to be a part of your journey as well. Thank you. Thank you for supporting our show. If you would like to get more exposure for your business, please have a look at our sponsorship options. Thanks again for supporting About the Winelands. Please follow us on YouTube and on our social media channels. All details and links are in the description.
Welcome to About the Winelands. In this show, we will be chatting to influencers and leaders in the wine industry, winemakers, restaurants, and other businesses. Tune in every Wednesday and Friday for our latest episodes. You will find us on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcast, and Apple Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so that you do not miss out. Now, to get on with the show. Today, everyone. Today, I'm speaking to Johan Crawford from Planet Wine. Um, it's a pleasure speaking to you, um, Johan, and uh, welcome to our show. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you all. Johan, um, tell us a bit more about your, um, your history and how you got involved in the wine industry. <laughs> it's quite a long story, uh, but I'll keep it brief. Um, I, I was born and bred in Stellenbosch, right in the heart of the Wildlands, uh, but really knew nothing about wine. Uh, after varsity, I stumbled into journalism, spent about 16 years in Cape Town, first at the, uh, in, in the electronic media and then in print media, then packed my bags and left for Joburg, where I started a PR company, ran that for 16 years, decided I uh, didn't like Joburg that much, returned to the Cape uh, to retire. And about after three months, I found retirement wasn't what it was supposed to be. And I was looking for something to do. And then a winemaking friend introduced me to the many wonders of wine. And I studied at the Cape Wine Academy, um, started visiting uh, winemakers, learned from them, and eventually got my hands dirty and uh, planted uh, Grenache vines at Nederberg. And from there, went to, through the whole process and I made my first wine in 2010 at uh, the Grindel with wow. much help from from cellar master uh, Charles Hopkins. Um, yeah, and, and uh, then out of the blue one day, I was approached by a major Afrikaans publication to do a monthly wine column for them. And I did that for a couple of years and uh, then started feeling like work and I chucked that. And uh, my lady friend then, who's my wife now, suggested I start uh, my own website. And uh, Planet Vein started as a purely Afrikaans wine website. And then I started getting uh, um, emails from readers saying, you know, why don't you write in English as well? We enjoy your read, your writing, but uh, very often we don't understand what you what you're writing about. And then uh, Planet Wine uh, or Planet Wine became Planet Wine, and ever since then it's been uh, bilingual. And uh, yeah, it's been a wonderful journey. Well, that's amazing. Um, so Planet Wine is that is that a, that is a blog, right? That, that's it's it's written word. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So, um, blogging, um, is this now your full-time profession or is it a side hobby or how do you see it? Uh, I'm, I'm just about everything I've done all my life has been driven by passion and I've got a great passion for wine. Uh, both my wife and I are foodies. Um, and mm -hmm. the funny thing is when I, when I got into the, the wine thing, I, for the first time, learned uh, the wonders of flavors and aromas. And uh, then obviously getting into food, the wonders of different textures. And we both love to travel. So we, we're very fortunate in that we uh, travel overseas once or twice a year. And uh, for the last 10 years, we've been visiting Europe, different countries, and obviously uh, enjoying their wines and comparing their wines and their wine tourism offerings with what we have. Well, that sounds awesome. I mean, that's the three categories on your blog, right? Wine, food, and travel. And now that's I correct. understand why you, why you chose um, these three. Um, have you have you travelled um, um, to other wine regions besides Europe? Um, uh, not yet. Uh, we've uh, last year we went to Turkey, which I didn't expect uh, uh, much in terms of wine. Then I did a bit of research and discovered that they also have a very strong uh, history. Uh, we went um, two years ago. We went to Russia and in Northern Europe, where I did not expect uh, wine. I did get wine. But I did find wine, but uh, very often made from berries and not, not grapes. Uh, but Russia, for example, as a, as a wine industry, and I was quite surprised to discover that. Well, that's something I didn't even know. This shows you, right? It's always learn something. So, Absolutely. Johan, your, your favorite wine region. I mean, I know you're biased towards Stellenbosch. But <laughs> tell us, you're, you've traveled a lot. So what is your real favorite place? Uh, I, I often get asked my favorite wine and my favorite wine area, and I always tell people, you know, it's like asking a parent of triplets, which is which one is your favorite triplet? Um, it's 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 so difficult. We we're just so fortunate in South Africa. We I don't think we really realize how spoiled we are for choice. 
not in just in terms of the diversity of wines and wine styles, but I mean the other offerings like restaurants, accommodation and activities to do. So um, yeah, I think I'm going to skip that one. I think every, every region is, is very special um, and uh, every, every region offers something unique as far as I'm concerned. So, so that's interesting um, to me when, you know, the first time I went to France, I expected um, uh, something similar to the Cape Winelands, whereas, you know, your, your Bordeaux, Bordeaux region seems to be a factory and, and Champagne is a bit more welcoming, but the, the Cape yeah. Winelands is really unique in, its, in the way it welcomes visitors, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. We uh, said uh, two years ago, I'm trying to get my bearings right, 2018, we, did, uh, we visited France and then um, um, Switzerland. And uh, I was, I think the big disappointment of France was Chateau Neuf de Pape. Uh, maybe I'd expected too much, but I mean, what we got there was not close to what we offer here in South Africa. Uh, uh, um, Burgundy, we were very uh, impressed, Chablis. But, uh, but as I say, overall, I think we offer um, probably better than, than, than most wine producing countries. Yeah, the experience is, is very, very nice. There's no wonder that we're one of the top um, tourist regions. So you and your blog is, is, I mean, you're influencing the industry. So if a winer's business are sitting out there and they say, you, I, you know, I, I think I'd, I'd like you on to write about my business or about my wine or my winery. How did they get your attention? Um, they, they send me an email, they contact me. Uh, 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 I said this to me, uh, it, it's, it's a hobby, something I enjoy very, very much. I don't charge anybody anything to do an article. We often, most of the approaches come from my side where I would approach a lesser known uh, or a new winery and ask them, can I come and visit you, uh, taste your wines and write about you. Uh, I don't, as I say, we don't charge anybody. We do it for free simply because I'd like to introduce more and more people to more and more wines and more and more wine areas. Um, so as I say, it's purely passion driven. I, I assume you, at least they give you a bottle of wine or, a, or a, 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 a dinner or a lunch every now and then. Every, every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just a quick interruption, but I do need to remind you that we are currently in a very difficult time. The South African government, businesses and individuals can donate to support our country through this crisis. Go to the website now and add your small donation www.solidarityfund.co.za Please join us all in the fight against COVID-19. That is at www.solidarityfund.co.za Now, let's get on with the show. So, so Johan, in, in terms of, you know, um, and the whole Winelands has expanded so much in the last few years. I mean, we, we, we've expanded, I mean, the all over the country there's wine now. So what is your, you, you know, what is to use the most exciting developments in the South African wine industry over the last few years? I think, I think the, 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 the one thing, as I'm, I'm from the old school uh, um, and I, you know, the, my friends who are in the winemaking business, uh, we, we, we tended to make, or they tended to make wines the way their fathers did and their grandfathers fathers did where today's younger generation are, are more energetic. They, they seem to push the, the envelope more. Um, they, they're more adventurous. They would try new varieties. The one thing I do like is the fact that, that we're spending more and more time on experimenting with, with lesser known varieties. Uh, a few years back, we were in Croatia and on the island of Cortua, I, I discovered some absolutely magnificent uh, white wines. And uh, speaking to the winemakers there, I mean, they've got very similar terroir to what we have so so there's still so much growth potential in south africa it's actually amazing so do you see um your your block planet wine um uh, you know um, expanding are you getting a lot of uh, you know your readers um if you have to say your 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 the ratio between south african readers and um, international readers what could that be do you know uh, I'd say it's about 80% local and about 20% overseas. Um, I'm, I'm surprised that I, we've actually got a couple of people following us from, from Russia. Um, I don't know how much they understand of what, what I'm writing, especially in Afrikaans, but uh, they seem to be very keen. And, and what, I, what I like about it, it's a, it's a small, I don't have a mass following and I've never been interested in that. As a, this is not for me to make money or anything. This is just uh, passion driven. And what, what, what I like about the people that, that, uh, that read Planet Wine, that follow it, is the fact that they're very keen, very enthusiastic. Whenever I write about a new winery or a new wine or a wine style, 
there seems to be a lot of comment uh, questions and people would go out and try it and come back to me and say, no, you, you're either right or you're wrong. We don't like it or we love it. So, yeah. So this question, next question I had is, you know, about the coronavirus and, um, you know, it's forced everyone to rethink their business models and, you know, your, your business model or your, your passion model, if I can call it that way, has been online from the start. So you're not really affected by something like Corona, but, but your, your, certainly your readers and other Wynans businesses are. And um, yes. what would you suggest for them? You know, um, uh, do you have any changes or things that they could do to get themselves, their stories out, and or maybe even additional digital business um, models? I, I think, Will, uh, uh, this pandemic uh, is forcing us to rethink many things. Um, um, in terms of, of marketing, in terms of marketing communication, um, I, I, I did find having a, a marketing communication background that uh, uh, too many wineries or wine producers did not really understand the importance of communication uh, as part of the marketing mix. Um, and I also found that too many uh, wine producers spend too much time and too much energy on the overseas market. I, I, I understand that is very important. But you know, if 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 you if you can't, uh, I think the ideal thing is to to have your local market uh, buy up all your wine. And uh, uh, for me, the perfect situation is where you've got to actually say, "Hang on a second, we can't sell you any more wine. This is meant for the export market." Um, so yeah, but we'll have to rethink uh, quite a few things in terms of our marketing. That's very interesting. I think um, you're right in that you're saying, uh, especially now when these lockdowns and stuff are are, are lifted. Well, tourism is going to take a while to actually rebound. So I think local tourism is going to be extremely important for all our tourism-driven um, businesses. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think we, we spend too much time concentrating on the overseas market. You know, uh, the one thing that we've found every year uh, overseas, talking to people saying, you know, come to South Africa, look at our exchange rate. Our, our range is worth nothing. So it must be the cheapest holiday ever. And they would tell them, no, no, no. South Africa is actually bloody expensive. And then we did a survey about two years ago, coming back from, from, from Switzerland, which is extremely expensive. And we did discover that, you know, very much of the pricing is aimed at the overseas market and not the local market. And I, and I hope that Corona will now force these people to say, hang on a second, your primary market should be your local market and your secondary market, your overseas market. So it's going to be very interesting to see how um, things change. That's so you want... Your wine journey seems to have to, I mean, I just, I just wanted to ask you something. Do you still make wine? Or have you uh, I, I, have, I haven't for the, for the past few years. We, uh, we retired to, to Jakob's Bay. Oh, okay. uh, we've, yeah, we've been living here for three and a half years. We're moving back to Melko Strand now. My wife's been suffering from sinusitis since we got here. So uh, uh, that's forcing us back to Melko Strand. We've got property there. So then I'll be closer to Cape Town again. And obviously, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to trying to make some more wine aside. It's, uh, I miss that actually. <laughs> so your wine journey, what is the most important thing that you've learned? Oh, uh, wine is, is not a destination. It's not a, it's, no, wine is not a, let's put it, wine is not a destination. It's a journey and it's a wonderful, wonderful journey of discovery. And the most beautiful thing for me after having been in it for about 20 years is there's no end in sight. <laughs> no end in sight, I like that. So, Johan, on that note, can you give us your very own wine quote or your favorite wine quote? That would probably be it. That wine is not a, a destination. It's a journey of discovery. And, and uh, um, I've just done an article on, on uh, which will be published soon on, on, on Planet Wine about people who, who limit uh, their taste to just one wine or just one style. And, and, and I find that so... And I don't want to be nasty, but so ignorant uh, with so many wine styles, so many wines out there that people just limit themselves to one wine or one wine style. Go out there, try new wines. Don't, you know, if you, if you taste a wine you don't like the first taste, don't push the glass away. Try it again. Be open-minded. And the main thing is learn, get to know the basics of wine. Understand what wine is all about, the flavors and the aromas. You'll enjoy it so much, so much more. Uh, Johan, um, I mean, that's such good advice. And, um, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to, to reading your new article. So if people want to get hold of you or Planet Wine, where do they find you? Um, well, obviously, planetwine.co.za. Uh, um, people want to send me an email. It's wine at uh, iafrica.com. 
uh, my details are on, on, on the website anyway. And uh, I mean, it, it has a, a Facebook page and people can just send me a message on the Facebook page. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, to lesser known, lesser commercial, unknown wineries contacting me. I'd love to do their stories. I'd, I'd love to tell their stories. To me, that, that's the one thing that, that I enjoy most. So, so Ian, going back to what you were saying in communication, right, I don't think that mm. wineries or wine estates realize they've got such a rich history and so many stories to tell. And it's Absolutely. great that you have the platform for them to tell those stories because, yep. you know, the, yep. more, the more you tell your story, the more people engage with you. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, to, to, keep, to keep secrets in such a competitive uh, industry is, is, is stupidity on steroids as far as I'm concerned. And there's an expensive way of communicating and there's a um, more cost-effective way of communicating. Uh, wineries and wine producers should sit down and rethink their marketing mix and don't discard PR just because some PR companies are very expensive. Uh, I totally agree with you. Johan, it was been a pleasure talking to you. Um, thank you, Paul. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. I will leave links in... in um, you know, uh, in the description below to, to Planet Wine and to your Facebook page and your Instagram and everything. And thank uh, yeah, thank you very much for spending the time. It was enlightening. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot and, and, and best of luck for the rest of the year. Thank you for supporting our show. If you would like to get more exposure for your business, please have a look at our sponsorship options. Thanks again for supporting About the Winelands. Please follow us on YouTube and on our social media channels. All details and links are in the description.
Welcome to About the Winelands. In this show, we will be chatting to influencers and leaders in the wine industry, winemakers, restaurants, and other businesses. Tune in every Wednesday and Friday for our latest episodes. You will find us on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. Be sure to subscribe so that you do not miss out. Now, to get on with the show. Today, we are chatting to Tim Pearson. Tim and his wife Vaughan are the owners of Seven Springs Winery in the lovely Overberg region of South Africa. Tim, um, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, it's great to have you online. Welcome to your chat. Thank you. Um, please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became involved in the wine industry in South Africa. Okay, I mean, I, uh, that's quite a long story, but I'll, I'll be as brief as possible. Um, yeah, I'm 66 years old. Um, I'm English. Um, I, um, born and bred in, in the United Kingdom. Um, but the South African connection, um, um, I'll, I'll go back a few years, 1994, 1995. My wife and I lived in South Africa with our two young daughters for six months. We lived in um, a place called Nelspreit, which is now, I think, Mbambela, um, which is mm -hmm. in what used to be called the Eastern Transvaal. Uh, we were going to buy a small cleaning business over there, but it didn't work out. But um, we were there for six months. So I guess that's where our real passion for South Africa came from. Um, we loved the Kruger Park and we loved the area and uh, things like that. So uh, the business didn't work out. So we came back to the UK. I built my business up over here, which is a commercial cleaning business. And 2005, uh, my wife and I came back to uh, South Africa for a three week holiday. We were in the Cape for three weeks. And it was my wife who said, look, if you're still interested in doing something in the wine business, um, wine industry, let's just have a look and see if there's anything over here. And we visited Hermanus for two days. And my wife said, look, if we're going to do anything, this would be a great spot. So came back to the UK, did a few web searches and found a piece of land that was for sale down the uh, Hemelinard Road and spoke to the owner. Uh, went back and, and purchased 12 hectares of land and that's how Seven Springs started. Initially we were going to go in with um, a few other people um, who were going to buy similar uh, plots of land and then go in as a, um, if you like, not as a cooperative but as a, um, um, a good joint venture if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, they fell by the wayside so we decided to um, start our own business up and start up a um, uh, Seven Springs, and I'll come on to how we got the uh, the name later. But that's uh, in a nutshell how we how it started. I have no I experience in the wine industry. So I was I, I was I was wondering about that because it's quite a jump from a cleaning business to to the wine industry. Okay, I look. I've loved, I've always loved wines, and a lot of our holidays um, when we were when the 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 girls were younger. We have two daughters, um, Kim, who's uh, 36, and Kate, our youngest, who's 33. Um, a lot of our holidays when they were much younger were camping holidays in France, and they always uh, were in um, areas uh, which were wine producing areas because I've always loved wine. Um, so that's um, where this sort of uh, the, the beginning of like the knowledge came from and visiting winemakers and visiting different estates and things like that. And a lot of them were very, very small people, very small farmers. So that's, um, and we didn't have, um, we didn't have much money in those days. So the, the holidays had to be done on the cheap, which meant we were um, taking last minute cancellation holidays and just going to areas that were beautiful and were full of, um, you know, uh, full of wine farms. Awesome, yeah. The, the, I mean, the French countryside and the French wine areas are such a joy to visit. Um, Tim, why did you decide to establish a new winery from scratch rather than investing into one um, that already existed? Okay, I, I guess I, the, the easy answer for that one, Will, is that um, I 
I guess I've always loved a challenge. And um, I think the thing is, it would have, yes, I guess it would have been easy. We have a house in Italy, okay, so we have a, a, a home in the area where they make the Verdicchio grape in, or Verdicchio wine in Italy. People say, well, why didn't you set up there? And um, uh, I, you know, it was, wasn't a matter of just sort of investing in a wine farm or something like that. I like to take something from nothing, from, uh, from nothing. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoy a, a challenge. Um, but we'd found this piece of land and we felt that we could develop it. We knew the area was good for making Pinot Noir and uh, Chardonnay. We didn't have a, a lot of money behind us. We didn't have, you know, um, uh, millions and millions of rand that we could invest in a, in a wine farm. So it was something we had to do from a, um, a more, if you like, a more modest um, start. And by buying some land and then planting that land and then developing it from, from scratch gave us the opportunity to, to, to do this. Um, and my cleaning business was, um, we employed 250 people in the cleaning business over here. Um, and that business was making enough money to be able to uh, invest on an ongoing basis in, uh -huh. um, in, in Seven Springs. That's awesome. Um, it must have been quite a journey from the time you planted the first vines to actually producing the first bottle. <laughs> I think that's a bit of an understatement, Will. <laughs> I mean, look, okay, I mean, it's, I know it's a cliche, but life is a journey. And I think what you have to do, if, if, if your passion is about something, you can find a way of doing it. You know, I'm not, you know, uh, you have to um, live within your means, I guess. But uh, it's been an interesting journey. I've had to apply logic um, to all I do. Um, but um, we have some good friends over there in, in the wine industry so we, we knew people like Bayer's Truta and Ken Forrester and Dani Devet. we'd met people like this before you know we even um, thought about buying some land over there and I always felt that the South African wine industry or people within that, that industry were very much um, very much united very much uh, pro South Africa very much pro the wine lands very much pro their own products and were people I saw had a real passion for what they're doing. But that's the same with anybody making wine or anybody in farming. I think, you know, you, people don't go into this type of business to make a lot of money. Uh, if, we'd have, if that had been something that was um, high on my agenda, then we wouldn't have uh, gone into the wine business. We'd have invested money in property or something like that. But... Um, I think the most important thing for, for us was, and I'm, I, I'm very much involved in Seven Springs with my wife as well. Uh, Vaughan, my wife, is, is, uh, works with me, and we, we, we work very much as a team over here. But, um, you know, so that's, that's the scenario there. Well, that's amazing. I mean, um, it's true that, you, that what you're saying is that farming, I think, lends itself, you know, to be a community type operation in the first place and it's it's very nice that you can actually you know um do your business and and you got you guys doing it as a couple is amazing um seven springs an interesting name where did that come from very good okay well if i tell you we we um, we purchased the land in 2006 and then we planted vines 2007 2008 so we actually have um uh sort of eight and a half hectares of planted grapes. But um, so the fact was we had time to think about names and, you know, do marketing and start getting things in, into shape. Um, the name Seven Springs took us about four years to come up with. Oh. It was only in, you know, we, we didn't want to use something like Pearson Family Vineyards and we, you know, we just couldn't come up with a name that we really felt was, um, was, was appropriate. Anyway, um, we decided that our first harvest would be 2010. It was going to be 2011. Um, but in November 2009, Peter uh, Finlayson, who is um, Bouchard Finlayson, um, co-owner and winemaker, mm -hmm. Peter said, look, if you want to make wine next year, i.e. in 2010, you can do so. Uh, because these, these grapes are uh, 
are, are good enough to make wine. So uh, we, we were then sort of a year ahead of what, where our plans were. And then we thought, oh, we, we've got to come up, we've got to come up with a, a name. We've got to come up with a, somebody to make our wines and somewhere to, to make the wines if we're going to make them in, in 2010. So we, were, we then started looking for an appropriate name. And it was actually my wife, Vaughan, who was looking online um, at Caledon, which is our nearest town. Seven Springs is between Caledon and Hermanus. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Vaughan was reading that, that Caledon has seven springs, six of them thermal springs, one uh, cold spring. And we said, that's it. That's the name. We, we had that eureka moment. Um, so that's, that's where Seven Springs came from. Oh, that's an awesome story. What's a what's a, a bit of inspiration there? So and I thought if wine make, if wine making is going to be half as uh, as difficult as coming up with the name, we we might as well get out of it now. Well, that's I mean, are you talking about that? I would like to um, ask a bit about your um, you know your wine making philosophy, and also tell us a bit more about the wines um, that you are producing. Okay, so. Um, the grapes we planted were um, Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay for the white, white, white grapes and Pinot Noir and Syrah for the red grapes. So we make um, six wines in total, uh, an oak and an unoaked Chardonnay. We make a Sauvignon Blanc. We make a Syrah Rosé, which is only in its second vintage. We've only made two, two Rosés. Interesting. We make a, a Syrah or a Syrah or a Shiraz if you want to call it Shiraz and a Pinot Noir. And I guess our wine, wine making philosophy is um, minimal intervention. We only um, use sprays and chemicals as and when uh, they're required. Um, so we keep it, um, I mean, minimal intervention is a very um, difficult term to sort of, um, uh, to sort of uh, quantify, but we, um, we keep it as naturally as possible. Um, we're not organic. We are not um, biodynamic because we have next door an apple farmer who uses chemical sprays and things, and we're close to people that are using um, chemical sprays. <laughs> so we didn't know um, enough about organic farming, living six thousand miles away. Um, so uh, minimal intervention is 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 what we do in in, in the actual vineyard and the winery. That's interesting. The the um the un, um, um, oat um, Chardonnay that you are making interests me because, I um, mean, you know, it, it, it was a fashion in the 90s in South Africa to almost over oak the Chardonnay. And, um, Correct. So, so can you tell me a little bit more about that? That's quite interesting. Yeah, from day one, Will, we've, um, we've only ever used second and third fill barrels for our oaking um, regime, if you like. Um, so we use barrels that have already been used a couple of times, three times before. I assume um, that is because your, your vineyard is quite new. Yeah, and the other thing is neither my wife and I like overly oaked wines. Um, I, why kill off good fruit with, uh, with a heavily, uh, heavily oak? I think if you're going to add oak or add oak barrels, what you need to do is to... Um, use the use the barrels as a or use the oak as a complement and not as a, a dominating factor and i think with with wine making and wine i think the most important thing is having the right balance so um when we started the farm um we, we when when peter finlayson said look you can make a wine in 2010 we had to find a winemaker so a very good friend of ours a guy called um guillaume now guillaume um said he'd had a young lady working for him for the season. He was a winemaker at Baxburg at the time. Okay. Guillaume came up with a young lady called Rihanna van der Merwe, and Rihanna um, was 24 at the time. So we took Rihanna on um, in um, very late 2009 to make our wines uh, in 2010. We didn't have a winery at the time, so we made our first wines at Iona in Elgin. And okay. In subsequent years, we made our wines at, um, at a place called Almondkirk in Elgin until moving to our own winery facility um, two and a half years ago. Oh, awesome. 
I see you've established uh, quite a good network of international distribution. Um, and that must have taken a lot of hard work and sweat. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because that was actually established in quite a short time for, for such an extensive network. Yeah, I think the thing is, it's about reaching out to people, but it's also um, difficult is the right word because, you know, you can't meet these people face to face often. Um, if you go to shows like Provine, and we've been to Provine twice, and it's mm -hmm. such a big show and has so many people going on. I think what I tried to do to start with was target people um, who I felt would be suitable for importing our wines. Um, we did. I hadn't. I didn't have a hit list of look. Let's have a look at this country first and that country second. I think what we wanted to do, the most important thing, was working with people that have a similar philosophy to us. Um, people that you felt could um, represent your brand in their country, but also people we felt we could work with on a personal basis and help build our business while building their business. And, you know, we've had some people that we've dealt with. Um, we've had, you know, we've we had an importer in the USA. Um, unfortunately, um, he, he, his business stopped. Him and his wife were, um, were divorced and we were ended, ended up um, owing us a lot of money and things like that. So you have, a, you have all of these sort of, um, you know, you can do as much homework as you can on people. Um, but you know, we have some good importers. Um, we have some people we've been, uh, uh, our longest importer is a guy called uh, Morton. Um, and uh, he's based in Denmark. He has a very small wine shop called Vingaven, which is in the north of Denmark. But, you know, he's consistently orders our wines. We go over every couple of years and do wine tastings with his, um, his customers. And it's a matter of building relationships up and actually working with people. So yes, we've got a we've got a we have a number of, of networks. We're actually looking at the moment at extending or expanding our international markets. But um, you know, we only produce 45, 50,000 bottles a year, Will. So you know, we're not a um, we don't produce a massive amount of wines. And certainly um, from um, our perspective, we opened a tasting room about 18 months ago, which is obviously closed during this current crisis. But that's um, obviously that's bringing more and more people in, both visitors locally and international visitors, because um, we are close to Hermanus, uh, international visitors to, to, the, to our, our vineyard and our winery. Just a quick interruption, but I do need to remind you that our winelands have some of the most fantastic places you can visit. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at Visit Winelands, and we will keep you updated with the latest offers and other special deals in the winelands. That is on Instagram at Visit Winelands. Now, let's get on with the show. Talking about the US, I see that you've got a brand called Over the Mountain, specifically that you branded for the US market. Um, is there a story behind this? <laughs> Well, would you think there's a story behind it? Oh, yes, that's why I'm asking the question, you know. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm a curious person. Uh, of course, there's a story behind it. The, the fact is, there is um, if you do a web search, you'll probably find that there is a, um, a Seven Springs based in Missouri, uh, a very small winery based in Missouri called Seven Springs. There's also a small vineyard, it's about 22 acres in um, acre terms, in Oregon called Seven Springs Vineyard. Okay. Um, the vineyard isn't, it's, it's just used as to produce um, Pinot Noir grapes, but um, that then sells, they then sell the, um, the grapes to one or two producers who produce the wine under um, their own label, but under Seven Springs Vineyard. So oh, okay. we felt if we we're going to sell our wines in, in America, uh, the only way of doing it was to um, um, come up with some kind of alternative brand rather than know looking at legal battles of um saying that we were called seven springs etc cetera, etc cetera. so we decided to come up with um, a different name for america and that name took me about 10 minutes which is which is um quite a, a change from the seven springs name. i was just thinking that it's it's like a it's it's quite, it's quite a difference and then, in change and choosing a name in time <laughs> 
and very easily well the the name seven springs came from um uh, uh, the name uh, over the mountains sorry came from uh, almost a literal translation of overberg which is the area oh, that okay. we're in of course so overberg uh, you being afrikaans i guess would know what the literal translation of that is or Mm-hmm. So it was it was very very simple to come up with that that name. I hadn't even we hadn't even thought about it before, and then when we thought oh, we've got to come up with an alternative name, it, it just sort of snapped, and we thought Overberg over the mountain. Yeah, let's go for that. So um, that's interesting to me that you mentioned that. You, I mean, you, you're obviously not producing um, in bulk, and um, I've talked to a lot of wineries before that you know are scared of the U.S. market because they feel they cannot really supply the demand that would um, come from the U.S. Have you had any um, areas in that problem or problems in that area? No, I think what you have to do is to choose. Look, you, the important thing I think is choosing an importer, and it's no good us going for an importer that is um, um, states um, wide or covers all of the United States because obviously we don't have enough wine. We don't, we, we couldn't supply um, a fraction of what they would look for. So you have to choose importers that probably have, um, you know, we have an importer at the moment, for instance, in Florida, um, they call PG fine wines and they're based near Fort Lauderdale, but they only cover Florida and they only cover the, um, the restaurants, uh, mostly restaurant business. And so, you know, they, um, they are of a, of a size which we can supply and look after and it works well. So it's about not trying to take, take off, chew off more than you can eat. So the, my next question is about, you know, your location. I mean, you're so well located between um, tourism hotspots. They're close to Cape Town, you know, close for uh, lots of international visitors in a place like Hermanus and... Um, uh, are you currently looking to expand your tasting room and maybe build a restaurant or accommodation or any of those things that most of you know the bigger farms are doing? Is that in your future plans? Um, look, look, I don't know. I mean, in, um, no uh, is the simple answer to, to the question. Um, we have uh, we have a, a, a tasting room. It's quite small. It's very personal. It very much fits in with our philosophy as 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 people, and I guess our as a, our brand. Um, what we are, we're very um, we're very inclusive people. We're very welcoming people, and anybody coming to the tasting room, it's a matter of giving them a, a, a you know a personal tasting rather than a generic tasting. We don't want to employ people in a in a tasting room that goes to a sort of a a checklist and said, well, this wine is X, X amount of uh, percent alcohol. It was harvested on this date. So um, when people come and taste wines with us, it's either Whitney, uh, the lady that runs our office, or Gus. Uh, we have a winemaker now called uh, Gus Dale, Gus up with. Rihanna um, went and uh, is now living in Australia. Um, she wow. met a guy from Australia and, and decided uh, he, he couldn't work in South Africa, so she decided to go and and um, and live with him in uh, in in Australia. But um, so it's either Gus um, Whitney or Renico, who's our assistant winemaker, who will do the tasting with people when when they when they come on the farm. So we can't afford to take somebody on full time doing that job because we don't get sufficient visitors. We get quite a few visitors, so. It's done by whoever's there, and if my wife and I are there, we we usually um, we we usually go and uh, come over to South Africa on there. Are um, you are you open stay. certain times, or do visitors have to make an appointment? No, we're open daily, eleven o'clock until four o'clock. So okay. our office, our obviously our our office is at the winery. We're open eleven till four. Um, we, if people want to come and do a group tasting, for instance, and we have some groups coming in from like. Uh, we had a group in from New Zealand last year, and I think another one from the Netherlands um, uh, last year. If uh, somebody's going to bring a, a, a tour along of, of seven, eight, nine, ten people, just let us know, and then we can prepare for it. But um, weekends, we open weekends from September until the end of March. Uh, we open 11 o'clock and 
until four o'clock weekends. Awesome. Turn now to something more serious. I mean, this coronavirus, um, I think, has forced everyone to rethink their business models. And um, I noticed that you don't have an online shop on your website, as an example. But um, do, you have any, do you have any changes or new ideas in mind um, going forward? Are you seeing any major changes happening? You said going to something more serious. I thought the wine business was quite serious. But um, <laughs> yes, I think what the coronavirus is doing, um, it's obviously everybody's going into a lockdown mode. And as I said, we, we live in the UK. We only um, arrived back in, uh, in England from uh, South Africa um, about 11, 12 days ago. Wow. Um, but what's happening is um, uh, more and more people are obviously shopping online now because they're unable to get to the shops. And online um, was not something we did. We didn't have an online shop. We did actually, our wines were or have been available online through a, um, a company called A Buzz. A Buzz are based in Cape Town. Um, a guy called Nick Plummer um, has been running and, and managing a buzz. He owns a, a buzz, but not directly. But we um, were in the process to, uh, before this happened of setting up an online um, an online portal on our website for our wines, and uh, we have someone who is doing that for us. She's based in uh, Johannesburg. Um, um, she is uh, in the process or has been in the process of setting up an online um, uh, business for us. Um, I understand online, I mean, we have a company over here called Slurp. It's S-L-U-R-P and Slurp are um, an online wine merchant in the UK. And they've seen an exponential uh, growth in their business, as most online businesses have in not just the UK, but I guess Europe. Uh, during the coronavirus situation, people are sitting at home, they can't get out so much. So they're ordering stuff that they would normally get from, say, a bottle store. They're now ordering online because there's a very little um, option of, of doing otherwise. But in South Africa, as you probably know, Will, um, we're not even able to sell wine anymore. We can't export any wines. So yeah, it's, um, it's actually, um, um, you know, everything is shut down. Yes, I'm, I'm aware of that. I think also I saw that some of your European distributors, I think the one in Germany has an online shop. So, so you know. And Vine is, yes, and Vine is, is 100% online, um, mm -hmm. an online um, wine, wine merchant. Okay, that's awesome. So, uh, Tim, what is the most important thing that you've learned from your wine journey? Oh, how long is this interview going to take? Well, <laughs> I mean, people are sitting at home, so go go ahead, you know, to pour your heart out here. But no, it's not a matter of pouring my heart out. Look, I think the thing is, and, and I'm not, I'm not just going to talk about what what we've done here. Um, I think if you have a passion for something, like I said earlier, you find a way of doing it. Um, would I've done something or would we have done something different if we'd have started again yes maybe and i think we we, we probably would have done but um i think what it's um, you know i i built my cleaning business over here from scratch and we now employ 250 people i hadn't i didn't have a i didn't know a thing about cleaning before i started that business i started from home because we didn't have any money um so uh, i think what um, I think what you can, can gain um, out of life in general is that if you've got a passion for doing something or a desire for doing something, find a way of doing it. I think what the wine, what, what the wine industry, what, what we knew from the start was, um, we are not going to make a lot of money out of the wine business unless you build a business up and then sell it on. Um, we were not looking to make a lot of money out of the business. It wasn't something we went into because we um, we felt it was something we were going to get rich on because we knew that was not the case. And I think what we did was um, we've uh, we've met a lot of people. We've actually been to a lot of countries that we wouldn't have been to. We've had a a, a, a really positive experience. We've had negativities along the way. There always are in any business or any 
uh, venture in life. But, you know, I don't have a philosophy, but, you know, the most important thing as far as uh, we're concerned, and my wife and I are the same, A, that we, we, we're, we're in good health and our kids are in good health. That is most important to us. And just treat people the way that you would like to be treated. You know, we, you know we're no different to anybody else. We may have started a wine farm and we may own a wine farm, um, but that makes us no different to other people. As I said in, the, in our philosophy at Seven Springs is that we're very welcoming, we're very open, we're very um, uh, inclusive. And I think that the thing is, it's, um, it's just the, this business has taken us um, to places that we wouldn't have been to and it's given us experiences we wouldn't have had. And, I think whatever you do in life, if you have a change of direction in your life, um, whether it's a, a job or whether it's a new partnership or whatever, it just throws you in a different direction. And I guess this is what's what's happened. If we hadn't have gone to um, Nelspreet, for instance, in 94, 95, to uh, look at buying this cleaning business I told you about, I don't think we'd have been um, um, uh, speaking to you now about um, having a wine business in in the western cape isn't it amazing because at the time you probably you know were a bit dejected because the cleaning business didn't take off and now you ended up in something that you really love no i've never been dejected because i've always known as i said if my wife and i are together and we've been married 40 years this year you know that to, to me is, is is very important i think what you have to do is really go back to basics if something doesn't work out yeah maybe the, may be a real negative to you at the time but I, I think life shows you that um, what happens you, you do something and it doesn't work out like I said it throws you in a different direction and you know what what was a negative and we loved a nail spray we loved the area of the eastern Transvaal um, but we came back to the UK and we built our business up here so it just um, you just get on and do something else awesome Tim, as my last um, question to you, can you give us your very own wine quote? <laughs> That's a very good answer, and uh, I think the, the very simple answer is no. I don't, I don't, I don't have any wine quotes. And if if I if I did say something, it might sound pretty cheesy. So um, I think um, okay, I'll give you something: drink wine and be happy. Drink wine and be happy. No, oh, that doesn't sound cheesy at all. That sounds right to me. No, I think the thing is, look, I think the wine business is, it's a great business to be in. You've got some phenomenal winemakers in South Africa. You've got some phenomenal people in the industry. You've got an industry that gets very little support from the government, uh, gets very little support from, from, from Woza. Um, unfortunately, Woza is, is, is vastly underfunded. But you've got some brilliant people in the South African wine industry that are really driving uh, the industry forward. They're earning the country a, a hell of a lot of money um, in exports and in revenue. And, you know, I'm, we feel really proud. My wife and I feel really proud of being uh, involved in, in that industry. And we've made some really good friends and we've had a lot of positive times. Well, Tim, I, it was great chatting to you and thank you so much for spending the time. I think um, our listeners will find this um, very interesting and I would certainly love to uh, meet you at some point and you know visit visit with you well you'd be very welcome to visit whether we're here there or not we're there for two and a half months usually as I say it's usually sort of um, most of January February and half of March but um, if you ever get to um, um, uh, Hermanus way or Caledon way you will be more than welcome as any of your listeners will Thank you very much, Tom. You're very welcome. Thank you for supporting our show. If you would like to get more exposure for your business, please have a look at our sponsorship options. Also, for a small donation of 100 Rand, we will list links to your business on our website. Thanks again for supporting About Winelands. Please follow us on YouTube and on your social media channels. All details and links are in the description.
Welcome to About the Winelands. In this show, we'll be chatting to leaders, influencers, wine producers, restaurants, winelands businesses, and other role players. Tune in every Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday for our latest episodes. You will find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram TV, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, and Spotify. <laughs> Good day, everyone, and welcome back to About the Winelands. Today, I'm talking to Paul de Villiers. Paul is the owner of Lanskroen Wines. Welcome to About the Winelands, Paul. Thank you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon talking to you. You have a long history in the wine industry. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and um, how you became involved with the wine industry? Yeah, maybe I should take it back. Uh, a bit further, it all started in 1689 when three De Villiers brothers arrived in South Africa from France. They came from a little town called Niort uh, in La Rochelle. And they started farming in the Franschhoek Valley. Uh, one of the brothers, my ancestor Jacques, acquired the farm Boschendal that we still know today as Boschendal. They farmed there for about 100 years and uh, uh, in, in Franschhoek, and then they moved to Boschendal. Uh, and then in 1874, uh, the family decided to move to the Achterpaal, where we are now. They started on the farm, Walter Frieden. And then later on, my granddad bought uh, two adjacent farms. And in 1963, my late dad and his brother bought the farm Lanskroen. So we consolidated the four pieces of land and we farmed it under the name Lanskroen since then. Uh, wine has all, always been made on the property and, and was mainly sold in bulk. But uh, in 1974, exactly 100 years after they moved here, we started bottling uh, our own wine under the name Lanskroen. The first one was a Sinso. And uh, I, of course, grew up on the farm and uh, enjoyed, you know, working on the farm during holidays and, and so on. And I think that's where the love for farming and eventually winemaking comes from. Oh, that's amazing. Amazing story, right? And um, you've been on the farm, obviously, your whole life. Um, are you um, one of the winemakers as well? Yes, and I, when I started here, yeah, uh, I actually, after, you know, the normal uh, uh, studying, at, uh, I studied at Elsenburg and I took a course in cellular technology, first uh, viticulture and animal husbandry, and then uh, cellular technology, and I did my practical at uh, Paderberg Wines in 1979. And towards the end of 1979, I started here with my dad, who was then the, the winemaker. And, uh, you know, uh, within the next two years, we made quite a few changes because the business uh, excelled a bit, uh, especially with the establishment of state wineries. Uh, I think when we established uh, the Lanskron wines, uh, there were only about... 27 private owned estate wineries. And then of course the, the number of co-ops. And where we've got today, probably about what, 500 small wineries. So it grew into, you know, quite a large business over the years, the old wine industry as such. Oh, that's interesting. Tell me, Paul, um, our listeners would be interested, what is the difference between um, an estate and a, and a cooperative winery? The, 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 in those years, it was uh, uh, the establishment of an estate in grapes or sell grapes if you're if you registered uh, make wine from the grapes from your own farm. We later deregistered, so uh, we were only then known as Lanskroen Wines and not Lanskroen Estate Wines. Uh, 
uh, that enabled us to buy in grapes if we wanted to or buy in wine and then blend with our own wines. Uh, but still today, uh, most of the time, everything that we produce uh, or we sell in the bottle comes from our estate. If there's a shortage of some wine at a certain stage or we had a bad year, for instance, for Pinotage or whatever, then we can buy in. I, there are not a lot of estates uh, as such remained, you know, uh, because I think most of them saw the benefit of maybe buying in some grapes at a certain stage or maybe buying some wine. But at that stage, I think it was a good idea uh, to, to uh, you know, establish this own, own, own private bottling of wine and, and have the terroir and, and also the, the specific area demarcated as an estate or a private seller. Oh, that's interesting. So when people come to your estate, um, you know, what can the guest experience when they come there? Uh, Lanskron is probably more well known for their reds. About 90% uh, of our crop is red. We have 15 uh, different cultivars. Uh, ranging from Sin, so you know, Pinotage, Cabernet, Merle, the whole range. We've got a few uh, not so well known cultivars as well, like uh, Petit Verdot and Malbec. And then we also have four port varieties that we use to make port wine with. Nowadays, we're not allowed to call it port anymore, but that's the style we make. We call it Cape Vintage. And it's, that's normally a blend of four different cultivars, Portuguese, Tinta Amarela, Suzhou, which are uh, one of the few cultivars that has got a, a red juice. And then uh, uh, Toriga Nacional is the fourth one. So those we use mainly for making port left over. Uh, then we'll make a dry wine from it and, and sell that as a dry red in bulk. We don't bottle it as such. And then, of course, the uh, stalwart uh, whites, the Chenin Blanc, a uh, little bit of Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, we buy in because the area is quite hot here. And Sauvignon Blanc doesn't work that well, but we got the market for the Sauvignon Blanc. And then uh, a very well-known uh, cultivar or wine is the Blanc de Noir, which means uh, white from red. If you translate the word Blanc de Noir, which is a French uh, a descriptive name, and we make that from Pinotage. It's an off dry pink wine, lighter than uh, rose, so uh, it's very popular in summer. And you can actually just drink it or have it with uh, something like salmon or something like that. So that's more or less the range that we've got. So we've got 20 wines on our wine list. Uh, so that makes uh, when when people come here, you know, they can taste these wines. We've got a food and wine pairing, uh, two different ones, a more expensive with uh, Paul de Villiers' wines, which is uh, a range that we select the grapes uh, and put more of that wine in newer oak. It uh, we mature it a little bit longer, so that's a more expensive wine, and we use that specific pairing with those uh, four. We've got four wines in the Paul de Villiers range, four reds and one white, which is a Chenin Blanc, which we also uh, ferment and uh, mature in, in uh, French oak casks. Then, of course, there's uh, what people enjoy here. It's normally a bit uh, quieter than some of the other very busy estates. Uh, We've got a lovely view. Uh, people can have picnic lunches here if they, uh, you know, uh, organize that beforehand. We can we can organize a picnic lunch for them. And there's some nice play area for the kids. Uh, we've also got uh, walkways through the farm that people can walk around. And, and then we've got the, these bicycle routes that uh, people can do the mountain biking. Uh, I think there is a link on our website that where they can have a look at how that is done. 
Well, that's awesome. Um, you also have a, a cottage on the farm where people can come and stay. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, we've got a cottage here and uh, it sleeps for, it's normally for a, like a family, small family, you know, uh, and uh, it's self-catering and uh, it's, you know, these, uh, this cottage is, of course, during the week or over the weekends. And they can also have a look at the website or they can just phone the farm and find out if it's available. And um, also a very nice view, you know, if people stay in the cottage, uh, they can look towards uh, Table Mountain in the evening and you've got that lovely view of the area from uh, the southwestern slopes of Powell Mountain. Wow, sounds fantastic. Paul, tell me um, your wines, um, where are they sold? Um, um, are you exporting any of your wines? Are you concentrating on the local market? How do you do it? Yes, we make use of Vinimark uh, to distribute right through South Africa and then uh, about 50% of our wines, just a little bit more than 50% is sold locally, but we've got about 25 uh, countries that we export to, some, you know, small, others a bit bigger. We've, we, we do quite well in Africa, uh, Namibia, Botswana, and then Tanzania, and also Zanzibar and Uganda, we tend to do quite well in those countries, and I think it's mainly because of all the lodges and sightseeing there and a lot of tourists coming to those countries uh, and then we have a uh, company in Minnesota in the USA which uh, you know they they service a few states from there and then different uh, agents uh, that sell our wine there uh, and also in China we, we've got an agent there that we export to so it's a uh, we try to cover uh the area you know the bigger area if if we can and we try to get new uh, agents in, in different countries we're busy now with one in turkey oh that's interesting so um the other thing that i was wondering um you know uh, it sounds like you've got a global footprint but um the coronavirus you know the coronavirus has forced everyone to rethink their business model we've been in lockdown now for a while things are reopening but um, do you have any new changes or ideas in mind? Yeah, I think all of us tried the online uh, business, uh, you know, online sales, and uh, it worked quite well. But what we found is, you know, the delivery of those uh, orders, it, there seems to be a backlog developed, backlog developed uh, for those orders because a lot of wineries have, have done that. And I think the companies that do uh, deliveries didn't really expect uh, the online orders to grow grow that as as it did over the last two months. We of course couldn't uh, deliver everything uh, we couldn't deliver so we had to wait for the ne next stage to open up that we can start delivering so there was a, a, a quite a big uh, number of uh, orders that, that had to be had to be delivered uh, suddenly. And I think that that was the, the the one problem. But I think that's a thing that one can look at in future as well. Uh, when everything gets a bit more calm, uh, that uh, the type of sales that uh, a lot of wineries will look at and will try to to make better in future. Um, I was wondering about you know delivery. Do you think that um, because of everything happening that uh, you know, more courier companies will come to the party and that delivery charges nationwide will actually start dropping a bit. Hopefully that will happen. I think after, you know, this uh, period that uh, a lot of deliveries had to be done in a short period of time, uh, uh, one that, that does that type of business, I'm talking about the courier companies now, will probably relook really the whole strategy and, and how they will handle it in future. But I think the main the biggest problem was all of these orders, uh, although it came in over a period of two months, maybe had to deliver everything. All of the wineries experienced the same problem, you know, that was such a big uh, uh, amount of, vast amount of wine that had to be delivered. And that's now the problem. Well, everybody wanted their wine but on the same day, right? You know, within the next week. 
That's the thing because everyone <laughs> was uh, starting to run dry. <laughs> Hopefully that will be sorted out soon. I think I think it looks like things are you know slowly um, creeping back to normal, and um, uh, so hopefully that that will happen. So Paul, your wine journey has been long, and and you know um, what is the most important thing you've learned from your wine journey? I think the the you know the whole wine making every year there's a there's a new thing that you learn and that you. Try from time to time. One has your recipe, you know, that works for you. Uh, later on, you know, which cultivars work better on which soils. And uh, the styles that you think will work better in the marketplace. Uh, but it's an ongoing, you know, making a change here. There are small changes because you can't really make big changes and then change your style completely because you've now got a a number of wine lovers that like your wine so uh, nothing really happens fast in the wine industry if i can say that you know you've got to take it just too quickly and do the basics right you know it starts from the in the vineyard make sure that you plant that uh, on the right soils do the basics right don't they, uh, let the uh, vines bear too much because with red you know, you want to keep the quality and you don't uh, want to have too much uh, quantity, then eventually your wines would be lighter in style, not uh, as it should be. Rainfall might have been lighter, it might be a drier year, so as we had about two years ago. And you've got to make changes in your winemaking process to... Uh, adapt uh, in that instance. Okay, that's interesting. So Paul, if you have to give us your favorite wine quote, or uh, do you have your own wine quote? I would love to hear that. Uh, I think <laughs> there, <laughs> there might be a few ones, but I think it's important to, to enjoy a good glass of wine uh, every night. Uh, you don't have to buy expensive wines but if you think the wine is good then you can drink that uh, you hear a lot of uh, comments from different people how the wine must be tasted and what you must look at the basics you can do but if you like to, or you get that question many times you know what is a good wine good wine is a wine that you enjoy uh, and then you you build on, on that and take it from there. Your taste will change over the years. The good wine that you like. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much. If people want to get hold of Lunch Crew, how do they get hold of you guys? And if they want to order, how do they do that? Uh, the best would be to uh, go to the website. There is a, a page where you can order or you can just phone uh, uh, Lunch Crew uh, on 021-631-1039. Okay, that's awesome. We'll put all these links down in the description. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, uh, very interesting. Thank you so much telling us a bit more about Lanskrun. And I'm sure that um, you're going to be able to welcome visitors to your farm again Thank soon. you, Will. Thank you for supporting our show. If you would like to get more exposure for your business, please have a look at our sponsorship options. Thanks again for supporting About the Winelands. Please follow us on YouTube and on our social media channels. All details and links are in the description.
Welcome to About the Winelands. In this show, we will chatting to leaders, influencers, wine producers, restaurants, and other role players. Tune in every Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday for your latest episodes. You will find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram TV, Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Google Podcast. Before we start the show, I need to share something really exciting. It's called the About the Winelands pop-up. And if you want to get your customers excited about your lockdown or online specials, you need to email us right now. Email us at visitthewinelands at gmail.com and add Winelands pop-up to the subject line. Who knows? We might just make you an offer you cannot refuse. That is, visit the winelands at gmail.com. Now, on with the show. Good day, everyone. Today I'm speaking to Lisa from Lisa Loves Wines. Um, and um, welcome, Lisa, to About the Winelands. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the invite. So, Lisa, tell me, how are you enjoying your lockdown period? Are you having a good time? Well, to be honest with you, I'm enjoying the two hours extra a day. It's um, quite refreshing. A wake, to wake up refreshed every morning is, is, is a nice thing. Um, I've never been a morning person. So, well, that's, that's quite nice. And otherwise, I must be honest with you, I enjoyed the time with my kids mm -hmm. and my family. It was all an unusual experience, something we probably will never have again. But I think it can slowly but surely come to an end now. <laughs> I'd love um, to go walk on the beach and okay. go back into the winelands. Uh, I miss it. I miss it terribly. So, talking about the winelands, how did you get involved in the wine industry? I went to Stellenbosch University. Oh, that's a good <laughs> no, way to start, uh, right? Yes, <laughs> I think so too. Yes, uh, a university in the winelands. You know, so it's um, everyone was sort of involved in the wine industry. No, um, seriously, I uh, at that stage I was um, romantically involved with. Um, which the person who's my husband now, and he was a, as a winemaker, and um, all the events we went to, everything was was around wine, and um, it was it united us because it it meant pe meeting people, um, eating great food, and having great moments together, and and we just we just loved it. It was a it was, it was a nice um, industry to be in, and it uh, involved and connected a lot of different types of people. So it, it was lovely. That's how, how it started. And um, he then moved uh, to Germany as a flying winemaker. And after my studies, I also went to Germany and um, stayed there for over 18 years before coming back to South Africa. Um, but because I studied politics um, and multicultural relations, my partner was, was stationed in, in a very small remote little town with only one, one uh, employer, which was at that stage, the large, largest wine producer in Europe. It was also the only place I would be able to, to work. So uh, that's, that's how I got into the wine industry itself. I, I started to work for, for this wine producer. And then um, once I returned to South Africa, um, I, um, that's how I created Lisa Loves Wines. I started Lisa Loves Wines with, with the experience that I had in the industry in Europe. Well, that's awesome. So, so I mean, you've been um, in the wine industry for for quite a while. So, um, and also, you, I mean, you speak different languages. Which languages do you actually speak? Um, I speak uh, Italian, um, French, uh, German, and a bit of Spanish, as well as Afrikaans. Afrikaans is my mother language. Amazing. So, um, yeah. Lisa, oh. Lisa loves wine. Started as a tour business. Am I right? Yes. Well. I, I worked in the wine industry before, so when I came back uh, to South Africa, I initially looked for, for work in the industry. But it really bothered me to think that I would be spending so much time in an office under a roof within four walls, uh, or, you know, or traveling again, which I, I didn't want to travel again at that stage. I wanted to stay put. So, um, you know, it started by chance, really, as it so often does. And... Um, one tour guide actually in a coffee shop recommended an institute where I could get myself qualified. qualified. And that's where I started to, to freelance as a tour guide. And um, 
I then started Lisa Loves Wines uh, as a company offering wine to us because that was in everything my background. And I just enjoyed it so much to be back in South Africa and the winelands. I wanted to, to share this joy, you know. Um, often people who live in their own country, inhabitants or locals of such absolute beauty are sometimes oblivious, you know, they're oblivious to the grandiose mountain backdrops, the sea views, the landscape, the wildlife. And that you can enjoy all of this till softly sipping wine in the sun. I mean, it's like gorgeous, it's simply stunning. So I, um, I wanted to, in, to enjoy it. I wanted to experience it um, more. And um, yeah, but the wine tours, they were just the start of it all. Uh, Lisa Loves Wine's goal is to be a, a platform where people can connect and learn and um, a platform where there is a, a cultural exchange, you know, um, and uh, enjoying authentic uh, cultural experiences. Um, yeah, so that's that's the, the beginning of um, Lisa Loves Wines was actually just showing the world what the Cape is all about. But in, in the future, I hope to show the Cape what the world is all about in, in terms of wine. So that's, that's the next challenge. So you can watch the space. Well, that's interesting. So, Lisa, what makes your, I mean, uh, why, why would I come on your wine tour? What makes your wine tours different to other people's wine tours? Well, they, um, they're very personal. They're um, authentic. They're in the tourist's home language. And uh, Lisa Loves Wines can relate back to the tourists uh, in the term that the tourists might understand and know because of my, my experience in um, in Europe and the mindset of the European consumer and uh, also the wine consumer uh, for which, uh, in which I worked, in the milieu in which I worked and um, as, a, as a brand manager and uh, in marketing and sales. So it's, it's a different type of um, tour if you can relate back to where the tourists come from now. Well, oh, that's interesting. So, um, are you currently, when people come on the tour, do you personally take them on the tour? Yeah. Yes, I, at this stage, I, I, um, I do it personally. Well, at the moment, not because of the virus. Funnily enough, um, the virus is, well, my industry is wine and tourism, and both of them are pretty much um, kaput now in, uh, in lockdown. But when I do tours, I, I do it personally. Uh, it's all uh, hands on. Um, and uh, yes, what people appreciate is the, the knowledge of, of, of wine, you know, as I said, in, in the language of origin and uh, the personal nature. I think people appreciate uh, an authentic experience. And I also visit uh, um, wineries that, not, not one of the more wineries, smaller wineries or, or just unknown wineries. You know, each winery has, has a story to tell. So um, that's that's what makes it a bit different. Well, that's that's very nice. I mean, that's that's our our um, you know yeah. aim is to tell the, the story of the wine. Yeah. yeah. I quickly want to share something exciting. I have heard via the grapevine that the Fishwives Club will be launching a new lifestyle club soon. If you have not heard of the Fishwives Club yet, just know that you are probably missing out on the sexiest wine label out there. To stay in the loop please quickly go and follow them on Instagram. The Instagram handle is at the Fishwives Club Lifestyle. Let me repeat that, at the Fishwives Club Lifestyle. Now, on with the show. So, um, Lisa, you're, in terms of any other services you offer or you're yes, planning yes. to offer, can you expand on that now or is it, are you gonna keep it a secret for, to a later date? Uh, it's a little bit, well, it's a <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit fresh, um, okay. but I'm super excited about it. Um, it's, uh, so I'm, I'm going to reveal it. It's, I, I would like to offer a platform for other wines, you know, um, for people in Cape Town who are interested in wines. I, I find that there's, um, there's a lack of accessible Europe, European and other world wines in, um, in South Africa. And I would like that to be, that will be my next project because I'm literally sitting at the source um, of a whole network of producers in, in the world that, that um, 
offer wonderful value for money and uh, are unknown. And I think uh, the South African wine connoisseur is appreciative enough um, of you know, good, good quality wines that do not need to be a brand or um, a well-known brand or, or wine. I think um, South African palates are evolved enough to be able to appreciate lesser known, good value for money wines. And I would like to, to, to import these and offer a platform, not only to, to taste the wines, but to experience them as a um, cultural offering, you know, with, 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 um, with food and um, just go on to see how it develops with maybe, you know, for example, if you do sherry, then you might have um, a, um, a flamenco player or, um, you know, you do sort of um, a pop-up uh, system where you, for one month, you, you, you showcase uh, sherry and the region sherry and the culture of sherry, the food. Uh, of Jerez and uh, the next month you do the south of France but with with brands that you, you might not know and um, are still great value for money. Um, uh, I, I look forward to partner with someone in the future and um, and offer this right here and especially now after Corona that might where people might not be able to or do not want to travel uh, to these countries then offering them right here these experiences right here might be might be very interesting. I just wanted to ask you about that. I mean, I think it's a fantastic idea, and I wanted to. I wondered if you're planning collaboration with um, some local mm -hmm. partners or even other producers locally. That I think personally that um, you know, for 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 somebody here to in South Africa to appreciate their own produce of, and, and our own um, wines, we need to expand our horizons and taste other stuff as well. So so yeah, I think that is absolutely a fantastic idea. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I have no uh, with other individuals, yes, but not with not with wineries uh, at this stage. No. Okay, that's because, interesting. Because um, I would be uh, strictly speaking, not um, not a competition to them, but it would also be interest. Well, funnily enough, the the winemakers in the region, all the people, the producers in the region, they all import wines from all over the world to be able to benchmark their own problem products. Because course, that's yes. the one thing that's missing in South Africa is that. Uh, we, we have every you know in, in European countries or in, in Germany where I, uh, I, I lived before you have everything on offer you have every country on offer and the countries um, compete with compete with one another on the shelf whereas here we only have um, generally speaking South African wines and um, I think people are open to to, to, to new tastes and um, new backgrounds and uh, new cultures um, and it's, it's just a question of um, of getting the right entry point, you know, because uh, the, there's a misconception that overseas wines are extremely expensive, but that is, in fact, because it's always the brands that we see, and not necessarily mm. the plain run-of-the-mill wines that are excellent uh, quality and uh, good value for money, and this is what what I would like to showcase. Well, that's amazing. So. Lisa, as a as a as a wine um, tour guide and also with your your business, Lisa Love Wines, and your presence online, you're becoming an influencer in the wine industry. So, if a wine producer or a wine estate is sitting there and thinking, "I want to get more people to me," how do they get your attention? What do they need to do? It's so easy, you know. All, you, all producers are unique. They all offer a, a story to tell, and I and I enjoy hearing all of them. The um, my main uh, media platform is Instagram at the moment. I just enjoy the simplicity of, of, of pictures, videos, of, and a few words. And um, each, this is, this is the thing that, that I particularly, as, as, you know, as with people, wineries, producers, each winery or producer has a specific angle and, and a, a specific story to tell. And I think that I'm quite good at finding that story and um, and portraying it, an, an authentic story, not necessarily that which uh, most marketers uh, tap into where you need a lot of money. I, I, I don't believe in that. I believe in, in finding that story or that angle, which everyone has, because all wineries are unique, all producers are unique. Uh, finding that story, and it's not an expensive thing, and then 
to of that and reveal that to the world. And uh, I think that's what makes uh, Lisa Lavoine unique, is the capacity to see that in uh, a producer or in a winery. That sounds awesome. So we've, you've mentioned the coronavirus and, you know, like you said, it's, it forces everyone to rethink their business models. Um, I like your idea of, 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 you know, bringing the world to South Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any other changes or ideas for your business in mind? Um, and yeah. do you have any, do you have any um, ideas for maybe for your producers as well on what they can do while they, you know, stuck in this, in a system where they can't really accept visitors to their, to their place? You know, it's, it's, I, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to, to engage with your, um, with your customers, with, with your public. Um, in uh, an interesting, yeah, well, as I, I always say it again, but in an authentic manner to find your, um, what is your unique offering. And um, that, uh, th that I find very important for all producers uh, is to find that and to showcase it. Um, but the way that the world of tourism will change, at least, is that I think we're going to have to focus a lot on, on local tourism and mm -hmm. um, engage um, our own people you know and that's going to be important for for wine reason producers to find a way how to attract them um i i envisage like family reunion packages you know where people can can come out to the winelands to a place that they maybe don't know and sit around a fire and and drink wine and enjoy each other's company as a family where they feel safe and and secure and that's going to be very important after the corona so that people feel safe um, and feel that uh, that things are clean and that it's, um, they can be sure that that um, they, they are, the chances are very small that they will contract the virus because that's uh, something that's on everyone's mind. Awesome, that sounds like a very good idea. Um, so Lisa, your wine journey has been interesting. So what is the most important thing that you've learned from your wine journey? That most people in the world have the same idea about life, love, and laughter. We can sit, all sit around a table and enjoy each other's company, all of us, mostly. It's rare that, that people are utterly unenjoyable. All we need is a, a table and a glass of wine <laughs> and a platform to connect. That's interesting. So on that note, can you give us your very own wine quote? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, wine and vines are, are very much like people. Those that struggle or make, uh, or make an effort in life are far more interesting and have more character than those who do not. Awesome. That's my finding, yes. That's, that's very good. Lisa, um, how do, if people want to get hold of you, um, how do they find Lisa Loves Wines? How do they find you? Um, on uh, uh, those are the platforms that I am keeping up to date. Uh, I'm restructuring my website as everyone else is doing in uh, the corona time. Um, and my website will be live within the next two months. Um, I'll have my new website out. Links down in the description. Lisa, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time speaking to us. And um, I'm sure our listeners will find this interesting. Yes, thank you. And thank you. Yeah, I know you're busy. So um, thank Excellent. you for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you for supporting our show. If you would like to get more exposure for your business, please have a look at our sponsorship options. Thanks again for supporting About the Winelands. Please follow us on YouTube and on our social media channels. All details and links are in the description.
Welcome to About the Wine Lens. In this show, we will be chatting to leaders, influencers, wine producers, restaurants, and other role players. Tune in every Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday for your latest episodes. You will find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram TV, Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Google Podcast. <music> Good day, everyone. Today I'm speaking to Thornton Pillay. He is um, the winemaker at Highgate Wines. And um, welcome to About the Winelands, Thornton. Thank you so much for having me, Will. Tell us a little bit, um, how did you get involved in the wine industry and um, how long have you been a winemaker? I was born and raised in Durban and lived a typical suburban lifestyle. Uh, my parents have been involved in the agricultural industry for many years, working at Freshmark. Um, with regular farm 